Uh, welcome to the community uh, moderators panel. Um, I'm Kate Gardner, and I'll be moderating, moderating this session. We're going to talk about the realities of working uh, in news and really across uh, news uh, across verticals to manage communities um, that may otherwise be challenging. And with me on this panel is the fabulous Liz Plank. Liz, could you introduce yourself? Oh, I have to introduce myself. Okay, uh, I'm Liz Plank. I uh, am a producer and correspondent at Vox.com. Um, I am actually producing uh, and hosting a web series around the presidential election. Um, I'm still figuring out a name for it. If you have any ideas, let me know. Um, and yeah, I'm a, I'm a woman on the internet. That's uh, why I'm here. It's a perilous <laughs> thing. <laughs> Nate? Uh, I'm Nate Lubin. Uh, I'm currently a consultant based in New York, working on my own on a few different projects, figuring out the next big thing. Uh, but previously, I ran the Office of Digital Strategy at the White House, and before that, I uh, ran online marketing for the 2012 Obama campaign. Right on. And Rob? Yep, I'm Rob Markman. Um, I'm a veteran music journalist with experience. I was over at MTV News for a number of years, and now I'm at Genius as their artist relations manager. My main job function is to take the artist community and bring them to our Genius Online community and have them share ideas and, and just talk and interact. Um, yeah, it's the gist of it. Um, I think, first of all, I have to read this uh, statement from OHS, which is the Online Harassment Summit where you are. Um, South by Southwest is committed to creating an enjoyable and memorable experience for all of its attendees and speakers. To help create such an environment, we kindly ask that all participants of the Online Harassment Summit act responsibly and treat each other with respect, empathy, and compassion. South by Southwest reserves the right to revoke South by Southwest entry credentials from any participant whose conduct is deemed inappropriate by South by Southwest or the Austin Police Department. Um, and lastly, personal items are prohibited from being left attended, unattended for any reason. Please do not save seats with your personal items. Any item left unattended will confiscate, be confiscated and destroyed by the Austin Police Department. No exceptions. Okay. Um, so we're stepping back to talking about uh, our variety of experiences. I've mostly worked with news organizations on figuring out how to scale uh, content management systems in a way, or excuse me, comment management systems um, in a way that makes it a reasonable job for someone to manage a community. Um, but Liz, could you talk a little bit about your experience as sort of an individual who doesn't have those tools? Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, like I started. I uh, got into journalism sort of through the back door, um, started petitions online and sort of as an activist realized that writing and using social media was a great tool to um, have a voice and find your voice and find other voices uh, to, to, to create and mobilize movements. And so, um, yeah, growing from zero to, um, you know, a couple thousand uh, followers in, in a very short amount of time um, became, or I, I guess I don't think about it as stressful, but I think it's a constant stress. Uh, I try not to check them in the morning and I try not to check them at all. I think Twitter mentions uh, with time I've just become, it's just become like a thing that I just don't look at. Um, and it's moved, uh, yeah, there's, it's like such a shame because there's so many positive, great things happening um, and interactions that you want to have with people. Um, and unfortunately, the amount of harassment that get, especially when you're talking about issues of equality. Um, I think it's very interesting that um, the harassment summit is the only place where someone had to check my bag to mm -hmm. come in. And I think it's great that we have security, but it's like unfortunate that it, the place where we are talking about the importance of security is perhaps a less safe space mm -hmm. um, and one where we need additional security. Um, A perfect, unfortunate metaphor for how to, to write on the internet and be on the internet when you are trying to create safer spaces um, for everyone. Right on. Nate, could you speak a little bit to sort of the scale that you experience, which is kind of the opposite of, of Liz's experience? Sure. Uh, so uh, on, on the White House side, uh, it is uh, you know a, a constant challenge of sort of the exact so you, you have a broad medium, which is sort of how these, these, these you know, channels are too often treated uh, by default because you have a, a news announcement, say, or a breaking uh, update you have to give. President breaks news. We have to cover it in some way. 
Um, but the, the challenge is how do you figure out ways to make that more meaningful and have it more more directly uh, engaged with the people who are there. So we, we would seek out um, you know, different ways of kind of building that into the program and at the side benefit of, uh, you know, in a scenario where other than uh, you know, literal threats where Secret Service would get involved. It's, it's tough for the White House as an institution or even, you know, high profile people to respond individually to less than positive content. But you use tactics like we did a thing around, uh, you know, the State of the Union is a very high profile moment at the White House. We, would, we had this thing called the Big Block of Cheese Day. For anyone who's a West Wing TV show fan, that might ring a bell. Uh, but what that was was a way of having uh, members of the administration across all different issues um, you know, take social media, take the online channels to respond to questions. Uh, and it's set up in such a way that the content is going to be much more positive, much more uh, tied to particular issues that are relevant and important, and you get a much more fruitful, positive conversation out of it. Right on. And to that end, Rob, your community has basically been constructed as a positive space. And you, you haven't had either of the issues that these two guys have had just because you guys started out at Genius with the intent of making this uh, constructive uh, community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, just what Genius is, for anybody who doesn't know, is a, is a lyric annotation site with user-generated content. So we put the lyrics up, the users put the lyrics up on the site if their new favorite song drops, and then the community works together to annotate these lyrics. It started as Rap Genius, um, but it's now just Genius and serves all genres. Um, but particularly even like in rap songs, the slang changes so constantly, it, 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 the music is in constant need of decoding. Um, so the community works together to kind of break down the, the artist's intent and what they mean. Um, and because the community has a goal, we have about 45 million visitors a month. And out of those 45 million, about 25,000 active users every week. And those users are working with the goal in mind to kind of come up with the best annotation for a specific lyric. And they work in teams. Sometimes you'll see our annotations might have one con single contributor who comes up with a really good annotation. But we have editors, so sometimes it takes two contributors. Sometimes, you know, on a popular song like Beyonce Formation, you might see a single lyric with 10 contributors because it took the community, it took 10 people to kind of come up with the right thing that everybody felt good about to explain that lyric. And because everybody is so focused on creating the best annotation, we find that because they have a goal, their behavior is they work together rather than against each other in, mm -hmm. in many of the instances. And Liz, in your experience, can you take a community that exists like that, that is, or excuse me, that exists in the opposite, that spends a lot of its time uh, being mean to each other or things like that, do you think that we can revert to something that's more constructive? I mean, that's the dream. That's how we're all here today. Um, and to build, uh, yeah, and, and a, a digital space that's positive. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm naturally optimistic. So I, I, I mean, the internet has, I, I would not be sitting here uh, or be doing, having the honor and privilege to do what I love if the internet didn't exist. Um, and the internet, I like love the internet. I love social media and I love the connections that I've been able to make and the people I've been able to speak to um, through it. Um, but, but it is difficult um, on those spaces because there is no controlled environment. Um, there is no, I guess there is a common, no, everyone has different goals. I mean, Twitter is a perfect example. Like I go on Twitter for a very different reason than uh, like an MRA activist, which is a men's rights activist, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, uh, would go on there to, to do. And so the issue is that we're all in that space together, and that's why it's up to those platforms to create and um, really defend what they want that platform to be for. Um, and I've been, ha like, I'm enthusiastic about co companies like Twitter and, and, and Facebook uh, especially really, really taking a stand. I mean, when I started in media three years ago, we had this FB rape uh, hashtag campaign that was started by uh, amazing women like Soraya Chamali, who spoke on a panel uh, today, um, and, and a bunch of other women who co-signed this letter saying like, there's all of this hate speech that's allowed to just exist on Facebook. Um, and it was gender hate speech, it was like calling for violence against women. And what they did was, uh, basically associate all of the 
horrible images and show like tweet to advertisers and we're like, do you want your advertisement for like Dove soap next to uh, you know a picture of a woman being gagged? Um, and getting the advertisers involved uh, or calling them out, I guess, and placing the responsibility on them put the pressure on Facebook because you got to follow the money, unfortunately. So, um, but 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 the thing is that's really interesting is that we're using those spaces to organize. To, to, to try and get them to pay attention. So we can't just be like, we're all gonna get off Twitter, we're all gonna get off Facebook, like we need those platforms to actually organize. So um, hopefully we'll be seeing people come together and those companies taking responsibility um, for what they allow to exist on their platforms, but there needs to be more of a concerted effort. Mm -hmm. Nate, could you talk a little bit about the work that you guys did at the White House to have those positive spaces and, and sort of how that turned into campaign strategy uh, online? And we were speaking about it a little bit before. Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, we can also, also, also speak to actual campaigning, which yeah. is a little bit different. But at, at the White House, you know, I, I mentioned the, the earlier example. There's, there's a, a number of other ones, but the, the idea is um, leading with the, the broader message of inclusiveness and, and, and leading with the content itself that you want to be shared and you want to get out there, rather than having uh, you know, a format where, where it's more, uh, more, more resistant and more inclusive to, to bad ideas. So an example of that, um, we did a thing called the Student Film Festival, which was uh, the first ever you know, it was for, 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 for students to submit YouTube videos and content. We got thousands of submissions. Uh, unprecedented. We had an event in the East Room, and the president involved, and all this different stuff. Uh, but it was teed up in such a way where, you know, while it was open to the public and anyone could get involved, and anyone didn't get involved, uh, the frame of it made it much more tight. It's much harder to be, uh, let's say, objectionable when you're talking about a 14-year-old's video than, you know, an adult who's got a different context and different, you know, a, a, a different imperative attached to it. Um, so there's things like that where you have uh, an ability to, to drive positive uh, engagement. Of course, when you have more controversial issues that can be more challenging, you're going to, you know, go full force into that anyway. Um, on the campaign side, I think it's a little different. You know, the the organizing component of this, which which wasn't my direct uh, part of the campaign, but but was one that I worked closely with. You know, in 2012, a lot of the work was around um, building communities that were tied to particular offline tactics and not just letting the online space exist for its own purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was really the key to having people who were, who were you know, participating very actively, not just you know, a random tweet or a random Facebook post, but really being part of the organization, feeling a connection, and that you know, makes it much harder for people that are going to be uh, you know, attacking the organization or, or just putting out bad content to, to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of started very early on, very consciously, and kind of used that positive organization to you know, be a self-fulfilling mm -hmm. uh, you know, process over the course of, you know, 18 months, let's say. Um, Rob, before we were talking a little bit about the ways that you guys have been managing user behavior, so putting people into penalty boxes, things like that, can you talk about how that's working and, and if it's working? Yeah, you know, so one of the things at Genius, um, first of all, all of the employees and the staffers at Genius, um, we all have accounts, we all actively use the site, we're all members of the community. And, you know, we have this ethos with us that we're not necessarily policing the community, but modeling behavior as well. Um, but, you know, you have sometimes, so I explained to you before that we had the annotations where everybody are working towards the goal. We also have open forums where anything goes and sometimes anything goes <laughs> over in the open forums and, you know, there's language, there, there is harassment, it, it, it's not zero percent, it's very low, but we have different levels of you know, community staffers. So we have editors and mediators and moderators who kind of step in. And we penalty box, we have what we call, quote unquote, a penalty box, where if a user harasses another or, or if there's an incident, you'll penalty box the offender and do private message, do mediation. And through that mediation, the mediator can decide and the community decides whether or not, you know, this is just an offense, somebody was having a bad day, how long should we suspend the account? But usually through mediation, we are able to work most problems out. Liz, you were saying that Box has some innovative policies in this way too. Can you talk a little bit about what they're doing? Yeah, Box Media uh, actually is hosting um, uh, a happy hour next door uh, after this panel um, in honor of the hack harassment event that they're um, organizing here at South By, but also 
a part of a larger effort that they're um, really taking on actually as a result of um, you know the conversations that occurred um, when this whole summit was organized um, and so yeah Vox is uh, partnering with Dell which is um, a huge corporation uh, and um, the Lady Gaga's um, foundation um, which I'm totally forgetting what's, what's it called her foundation fear Born this way. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, so what's interesting with that is, yeah, a media company partnering with a big company, um, the a big tech company, but also with the foundation. Um, and they really want to just put all of those people in the room together. Um, the issue that we're trying to solve with that um, is to disrupt this, um, the, the efforts that are all happening in silos right now. And, and you know, part of me thinks that the fact that I, I'm like so happy that South by created this summit, but I want, like, I'm, I'm worried that we're just talking to each other, <laughs> and, like, that's what I feel like I do all day, um, and, and uh, I think we need to talk uh, across, uh, across fields, and, and, you know, my expertise is very different from the expertise of a developer or someone who studies behavioral science and understands human behavior, um, and, and a woman who's gone through a lot of harassment uh, has a, a unique experience and, and, and expertise that she can share and, and putting all those people in the same room is basically what we're trying to do um, and we're you know reaching out to partners like Facebook and Twitter and hoping that they join us um, and uh, yeah it's 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 very new uh, and we're figuring things out so we're very open to suggestions uh, or people who want to join us um, but basically we're just starting the conversation, putting people in a room and trying to figure out um, a solution to this. And, and you know, that's sort of what Vox is doing externally to address the issue. Um, but internally, there's also a lot of um, awareness and, and, and effort put into what it's like to be a writer or be an editor or work at a media company um, and have to deal with harassment. So, uh, you know, I, I, we were just talking about this before, but you know, if, if I'm a if I'm a writer and I'm in my office and a guy barges into the office and starts screaming at me and like mm -hmm. you fucking c word like and like m like my boss would definitely be like that's not acceptable and throw them out and ensure that there are safety measures to to prevent that from happening. But um, a lot of the harassment that we're talking about and a lot of the hostility. Is happening online and so my boss or my manager is, is perhaps not aware that it's even happening because it's it's not even happening on the private space of the company uh, even digitally so in the comment section for example um, it's happening on Twitter it's happening on Facebook it's happening on all of these platforms that I'm required to use for my job um, but that are unsafe spaces for me so um, it is truly a, a workplace issue. It's, a, it's an online internet issue that we need to address, but for companies to see it as, you know, if I, if I don't listen to uh, my employee who's going through harassment or who's dealing with this issue, I'm actively um, agreeing to a hostile work environment. Um, and I've been very lucky to work at a space, you know, before uh, Vox I was at Mike and, um, they took my concerns very seriously, and whenever we, one of our writers got emails with you know rape threats and death threats, and uh, they were very supportive. Not only in you know, do you want time off? Do you want us to help you with anything? Uh, but also in in actually take you know, we removed the comment section altogether uh, because it was just too uh, dangerous for for employees, mm -hmm. and there was just like, what's the benefit here? Um, so 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 yeah, that's kind of. Um, Let's spin off on of that. So guys, how do you discuss? So Nate, you consult as well as I do. How do you discuss the value proposition of having a community that supports if it requires so much work and leads to so many bad things? It's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it, I think it speaks to trying to to dive into the specific purpose that the organization is trying to take on and. The reason why you have a community is to address a problem that, or a consumer base, or customer base, whatever it is that you're trying to, uh, to to take an action, whether that's buy a product or engage in an online media environment or whatever it may be. And if you tie in the positive nature of what's going on to the brand itself, uh, that's got to be the key to it. But I think the second part, and you're sort of getting this, is you know, and you're talking about channels that you don't control yourself. There needs to be more built in in the moderation side. There needs to be more uh, imperative driven around uh, empowering the people that are running these organizations to 
to enforce norms of, of positivity that are can be very hard right now. You see that all the time. I don't personally use Twitter very much now that I don't work at the White House. My official account was reassigned. Um, and you know, it's 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 not you know I, I use it for for consumption of news more than actually putting out content. Um, and I think that's part of it. It's you know I, I experienced firsthand what it's like to have stuff go at you, and it's not particularly pleasant. Um, but it's a uh, it's a reason to to make sure you're engaging when it when it makes sense. And Rob, so you guys, your value is the community. Like yeah. Genius is community is pretty much it's 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 value prop. I assume to your investors. Can you talk a little bit about how investors are are talking back to you, or how the business is building itself around that user growth? Um, yeah. So yeah, Genius absolutely will be nothing without the users. Um, and you know, in terms of our investors and just where the company is going, I think that is very attractive because we have a captivated and active audience um, built into what the site is and the ethos of the site and everybody walk, working towards one common goal. Um, you know, has, has investors, have we fully learned how to harness that yet? Like, you know, I think at, at Genius, the first thing, the first step is to build a very good website with a very good experience and the rest will figure it out. And I think these are the next steps for us. But, you know, we have to prove that, that it works. And, and so far we've had um, really, really great interactions and positive community experiences. And, and just going to Liz's point, I, I think Liz made a, an incredible point about a coworker wouldn't come into her office and scream things that somebody might tweet at her online. One, because that's not accepted in the workplace. But two, you know, it's easier not to excuse the bad online behavior. Generally, people will tweet things at you or say things online that they wouldn't say to your face because it is horrible when it comes out of your mouth. Um, and what we strive to do at Genius too is we tr strive to balance like online and in real life experiences. Um, our community in Australia took it upon themselves to meet up one day and just annotate Kendrick Lamar lyrics. Or we have a really, really active community around Hamilton, the, um, Lynn manuel Miranda play and, and they've been annotating and Lynn gets on the site and they get excited whenever Lynn comes on the site and likes, you know, there's a cosign button which is like the Instagram equivalent to likes. So they get excited if they did a really good an annotation and, you know, Lynn hits the cosign button. Um, and the president of our company actually took one of the top scholars of Hamilton um, just two weeks ago. They went to go see the play together. Um, we have a live event space in our Brooklyn office, so we are actively thinking ways to invite the community and also create a real life experience so you know who's on the other end of that handle. It's not, you're not just talking with a handle, you're not just working with a the handle. There's a real person with real feelings to consider before you communicate something ill to them. Liz, what do you think? So we're both part of the list, which I run, and uh, one of the things that's different between uh, that community, which starts as a listserv and then becomes in real life events, is that uh, the way that we bring new members in is that we go out of our way to know who they are before mm -hmm. we invite them to join us. Mm -hmm. What do you see, do you think that it would be better for us as internet citizens to bring people in in that curated fashion into the media communities that we run? Uh, no, because then you're preaching to the choir. Like, I don't want to just <laughs> write about feminism and, and pull in feminists and we're like, yeah, we all agree, great. Like, that's, <laughs> that's not the point. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's a valuable proposition and would solve a lot of issues, but at the same time, like, it, it just creates more, po I mean, it's like the filter bubble, but for people. So, you know, people just who agree with each other speaking to each other. Um, and, and I think actually a lot of the animosity comes from that, right? It's like, you, you know, the other side, you're, you're dehumanizing the other side. You're dehumanizing whoever is, 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 you know, has that opinion. And I think, you know, to your point, the anonymity uh, aspect is really interesting. Like, I was uh, recently on, like, my first Virgin flight, which is really, really fabulous. Um, and they have a thing where you can, like, watch TV and then they, there's, like, a little remote and you can, like, comment and watch it with, like, let's say, like, I was sitting with my producer and he was not sitting next to me, so we were, like, you can watch the same show and then you have like a little account, like receipt number, and you can be like, like this is so great, like yeah, it's awesome. So we were watching this Disney show, and like we were just joking around and being like, oh my god. And then what, uh, like a random person called Uma 
comes into like the show and uh, Uma just says, you guys suck. And we're just like, both of us are like, oh my God, who's Uma? And we're like, who's, and she's like, like she's C38, like, oh my God. And I'm just imagining like this towering, like Uma Thurman basically, but like super mean, like, and I'm just like, oh my God, is she, who's, and then we just sort of like felt bad. And uh, I had to go to the front of the plane for, for something because we had other coworkers there. And I walk around, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to walk by 38. And I look over and it's a seven year old boy <laughs> <laughs> sitting with his mom next to him who has no idea that he's just like insulting random plane goers and like for no reason. And then I just like, I just start laughing on, like I am crying. And I basically tell Billy, my producer, I'm like, like this is basically like Uma is the internet. Like that's just a metaphor for the internet, like you get a comment like that, you get, you know, someone who just rips you apart and then you just, that's all you think about, right? And you think about it over and over and over again. Whereas, you know, you get a hundred people telling you that they love your writing or that they appreciate you and you focus on that one that person who doesn't like you, but that guy could be a seven year old little boy who really actually like doesn't even remember that he told me that I suck. Um, and if I wouldn't have known he was a seven year old boy, I probably would still be thinking about why Uma hates me. Um, anyway, so all this to say, just, yeah, like don't let the haters get you down, I mm -hmm. guess, because you don't know who, who they are. <laughs> Nate, what's a really constructive way that you have had a client or helped a client to deal with a trolling problem? Uh, well, I'll give an example that's not a client, but uh, uh -huh. a friend of mine, I was telling these guys before this, but a friend of mine works at the company Nextdoor, uh, which is a social networking uh, site for uh, specific areas, an, an offline equivalent, it's the online community for it, for, for neighborhoods. And uh, she was telling me that they had had an issue uh, early on when they were, you know, much smaller, uh, where there was a, a neighborhood where there was uh, a lot of harassment going on from a specific person. There was one guy who was poisoning this neighborhood and the, the leader of the, of the group there, you know, with the participation and help of the company or the follow-up of the company, uh, actually saw the person in real life at a, at a coffee shop or something and walked right over to him and, and like had a conversation about it. It was like, hey, you're screwing up our thing and this is awful and, you know, stop being an asshole basically. And problem solved. Uh, you know, it's kind of an amazing uh, forcing the anonymity to disappear for a second. You know, it's an unusual case. You can't do that everywhere. Um, but the company was felt personally uh, responsible in a way to work with the person who was, you know, the community manager, um, you know, random stranger, and they figured out a way to get, uh, you know, uh, in a situation that could have spiraled out of control, gotten worse, and, and made it made it much better. So I, I think it's sort of illustrative of. Uh, you know, if you have an organization which is trying to uh, address these problems head on and particularly one where there's a more closed community where these kinds of problems, uh, if allowed to get in a bad space, um, would really undermine the whole reason why you're there, why you're being a part of it, like, that's really the key. It's, it's figuring out mechanisms to, whether they're, you know, offline, online, blocking, whatever it may be, uh, but take it seriously and work on it. Mm -hmm. Liz, what do you, when you're coming into Vox now, what are you thinking about uh, making sure happens on this show versus what happened on Flip the Script around uh, your community? Around my community? Uh, wait, what do you mean? Like, so that it's more... How are you engaging with your uh, audience? How do you think you may engage with your audience differently? I mean, I, so Flip the Script um, was a show that I did at Mike, which uh, looked at a variety of social issues um, and like flipped the script on that. So flipping the script on like uh, reality basically to show um, inconsistencies or inequality and, and, and say that it shouldn't be that way. Um, but it was like very like, this is how you should think about this. And if you don't, then like go to, not go to hell, but like, you know, mm -hmm. this is it. And it was a very um, like voicey in that way. And I, and I am like, I guess I do talk like that and I, sometimes I should tone it down a bit. Um, but I think it unfortunately created, um, or like I didn't reach as many people as I could have if I would have respected the other side a little bit more. And uh, you know, Ezra Klein, who's the editor in chief and founder of uh, Vox.com, says it perfectly, um, but like that the voice, vo the, 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 the voice of Vox, you want to represent the other side in a way that the, if the other side read that or saw that, would agree with you. So what I would do often, you know, is just be like, 
I don't know, when I was like writing about Robin Thicke, for example, which like, uh, you know, and I like hated Robin Thicke and like he was the biggest misogynist of all time. And I just like went after him and, you know, with snark and, and, and humor, but still like, I was really mean to him. <laughs> and I kind of feel bad. Like I kind of feel like, well, if you're a person who likes Robin Thicke or who doesn't think that his lyrics are problematic, if I'm coming at it from a perspective where like he's a raging misogynist and you don't start from that perspective, then you might stop reading what I'm writing or you may stop watching what I'm saying. Um, so, so yeah, I think more than ever, especially given we are living in a very polarized world, um, but when we actually talk to each other, it changes everything. Like I went to CPAC, you know, the Mecca of conservative, you know, politics and I obviously don't agree with a lot of uh, conservative ideologies, but like we still had a laugh and had a great time. And every single person I talked to there, like at the end of the day, like we may not agree on everything, but we're like human beings and we can have a conversation. Um, so I, I hope to bring more, more of that, um, less polarization and more conversation. Nate, what are you telling your clients now uh, about either managing existing communities or how they're, they should build communities uh, at new company? Great question. I mean, I think I think it's it's figuring out uh, you know the, the core motivation. I mentioned this earlier. You know, the, the example that comes to mind. And pivot quickly to another Obama example. But uh, my job in 2012 was uh, to run the online advertising team, and we had by the end of it, you know, more than 100 million dollars. That was you know a bunch of different purposes and resources that you know are kind of crazy. Uh, but that leveraged you know, a lot of brands and companies that we work with now. You know, have similar types of resources at their disposal. Um, that means that when you're constructing things like this, you're, you're, you're working with vendors, you're working with partners to uh, engage people that are outside your community to bring them into the community. In that context, it might have been around uh, getting people to do voter registration or to be part of uh, an online discussion about a policy issue or whatever it may be. Um, that affords you an ability, because there's real money on the line, to, uh, to enforce some norms around how that content will be distributed, would be uh, released, could be commented on, could be replied to. Um, so I, I can think of a bunch of cases where that was part of the initial conversation. You have, you know, if we're going to do an upfront for $10 million, these are the list of demands we're going to have. And, you know, they're going to have performance parts of that. Of course, that's where you're, that's where you're going to your money on. But you could also have norms around uh, and how people can say, I don't mean to censor them, I mean to enforce uh, a way of having positive commentary or positive dialogue. Uh, and I think a lot of times uh, brands currently are really thinking about that bottom line uh, in the short term sense and they could spend more time uh, making sure that the communities they're building uh, you know, foster a longer term vision that's more in line with the community that they want to be creating. And Rob, as you scale, actually, that's probably a big question. You know, how do you keep this intimacy that you've developed uh, as you get past 25,000 users to 250,000 users to 2.5 million? Pray. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you know, but you know, we we have to just continue to grow with, with the demands of, of of the community. Right now, we have the luxury, I think, of having a you know, in the scalable sense, an intimate community um, that we can manage. You know, if things go awry, um, that's something that that we think about seriously every day. We, you know, I, I won't say that we have a plan of action. There's no um, like software in place. I know we, we spoke about that before coming to here. Is, is anybody implementing any software or something that helps police or monitor the behavior and help curb it? We aren't there yet. We've just been doing what's working and, and, and mm -hmm. hopefully as the community grows. Because also just one thing to point out is that um, the moderators and, and the mediators are actually members of the community. They aren't like paid staff. These are roles that community members take on because they exemplify good work. So the whole business, as the community grows, you know, there'll just be more roles, more moderators, more mediators, more people to kind of help model the behavior that, that we want, you know, the site to stand for. Right on. Um, and a lot of praying. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. You think about it in the context of Reddit and how Reddit's kind of lost control of some of its cases. Yeah. yeah. You know? You know, it, it, um, in a lot of interesting ways, too, like you see, and, and me being within the artist relations realm, you know, again, a major part of my job is bringing artists to the community and, you know, back and forth dialogue, communication, 
And, you know, you see on Reddit those AMA style things go south very quickly or on Twitter, you know, Robin Thicke had one a, a couple of years ago. And that's not to say that, you know, the, the conversation about Robin Thicke being a misogynist wasn't a conversation to be had. It's just maybe Twitter wasn't the right form for it. And maybe genius isn't the right form for it either. Um, you know, but yeah, things go south very quickly. <laughs> you know when it's going to be a bad one. Uh, every time a client wants to do an AMA, I'm like, here are the bad ones. Please go investigate. Do you have any hidden secrets that I should know about first? <laughs> um, so I wanted to open the floor up for questions uh, for the last five minutes of our panel. Does anybody have anything they want to ask any of our illustrious panel? Winter? Go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who went through this, uh -huh. what is your position? I think I really identify with you with what you said, is that you are in a situation where you are often the person that's perpetrating the hate, and then sometimes you're just the you're you're receiving it. Right. Where is the balance? I think I think the example would I would use Trump. Fuck, you just got to use him. But we're in a situation where you were we, following up his name with the, with the, with the F word. <laughs> well, you know, fuck <laughs> So <laughs> you're Funny. sitting, you, you, you're getting ratings because his antics are absolutely exactly what he's 16, not we, maybe the royal we, but like the lower we is totally buying into. But then at the same time, everything that he's saying is the antithesis of what it is that you would really want out there, but you know that's what people feed on. I think it's sort of like the Kim Kardashian effect. Right. Where do you feel that you fit, all of you guys maybe, you fit in the middle? And then like a follow-up to your comment about managing a community, um, you can manage it at a certain level, but then you can't, you, you, do you have a plan beyond that level? So 25,000 is easy to sort of negotiate, but 250, 2 million, yeah. that starts to become a different conversation. And I've obviously, Kate will tell you offline, mm -hmm. why I know that it's really hard to manage that. But what is your plan if you have a plan and does your company have a, a, an idea of what's the best way to sort of go about that? Are you com or are you comfortable at where you're at until you feel like you can go to the next level? Right. Rob? You first? Yeah. Um, right now we're, we're comfortable where, where we're at to answer that question. Um, we, we don't have any reason to believe that um, how we do it won't work, but obviously we'll be entering, hopefully we'll be entering new frontier, and we know that we'll encounter problems, and we just have to deal with them. You almost try to stop the problems when it starts, so once you see things start growing and, and kind of getting out of control, we, we have to figure out new ways and think about our company differently. Right now we're comfortable where we're at, but we're not so naive to think that the bigger we get, the more problematic things we get. Um, but, you know, I, I couldn't speak of a specific plan right now today. But it's a great question and, and something that we're actively thinking about. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's okay. The Trump thing. Um, I feel like if Trump, yeah, I feel like there, we could have a whole panel about Trump. Uh, I think about Trump a lot. Um, and, but like, and I, I'm very honest with you. Uh, media um, is having very, very critical conversations and self-critical conversations about how to cover someone like Trump, how to stop a guy like Trump, um, and, and what our responsibility is in perpetrating um, his uh, monopoly on, on everything. Um, and I absolutely think that, that we have a responsibility. I will say that none of us knew and uh, that this was going to unfold the way that it did. Um, a lot of people you'll notice who are on the Trump beat are like 22 year olds who just started <laughs> because they were like, uh, here you go on, you're, you're following, you know, Santorum or whoever, uh, just add Trump to that. Um, <laughs> and in the end, they're like on TV every single day and like traveling and, and, and it's great for them uh, because they're getting all of this experience. But, but uh, you know, when he went down the escalator, we put cameras on him and we're like, okay, we're gonna let him do his stupid show and then it'll be done, but it wasn't. Uh, and it's been growing ever since. And what happened, last, I mean, but so the, the balancing act is do we, and I've thought about this, like, do we leave 
let what he says and the hateful things that he says and the bigotry go unchecked? Do we not cover it and then give him more of a monopoly over what he says and not question it and not criticize it? And Trump is very vocal in the way that he hates the press uh, by, you know, at his last, um, at, you know, Super Tuesday 2.0, like handing out steaks and uh, discontinued Trump products um, and just saying like, oh, they, they won't even take him, they're dishonest. Like they're, and, and obviously the last night with what happened at the, the Trump rally and the violence and, you know, the word Trump is now a, a racial slur um, that children and teenagers and young people are using. I mean, it's, it's affecting not just voters, it's affecting everyone. And yes, the cameras are on him, but we need to put the cameras on the hateful things that he's saying and, and have a, a space to be critical of it. Um, Huffington Post, for example, you know, after every article, well, at first they only covered him in the entertainment section and put all of his stuff in the entertainment section, and then they ended up just having, you know, at the end of every Huffington Post article that mentioned Trump, uh, it says, you know, Donald Trump is a bigot, a racist, and, uh, you know, and, and, and a whole, I, I mean, it's, it's true. Uh, <laughs> and um, so I think that's showing some responsibility, but, but it, it's, it's really hard. I mean, I'm like open to suggestions uh, from, from everyone because it, it is something that, that, that everyone in the media is, is um, gr you know, sort of struggling, struggling with. Like, because you want to you wanna call it out, um, but you also don't want to give it more oxygen. Anyway, I have like so many thoughts. So <laughs> talk about it. Do you have a question? Yeah, so I like your metaphor of the harassment in the office of someone walking in and cursing you out and there being a clearly defined framework for that. However, as we work more and more online and social media, the boundary box of the office bleeds and the ability for harassers to affect our lives and get information about us. And I think about what happened with Sarkeesian and Gamergate about her family's address being published, and that's just one of many. What, one, what can we do to help mitigate that other than not doing our jobs? And two, what responsibility does the workplace have for that kind of mitigation? Because we are required to do this as part of our jobs. So I actually had an incident. I was at Newsweek two years ago, uh, right when we did the cover story. We actually launched here at South by Southwest, where Lee McGrath Goodwin, Goodman, excuse me, uh, published a story about the guy that allegedly. Uh, um, and we, our entire C-suite, ended up doxed. It got all sorts of. There was much excitement. Uh, <laughs> everything bad thing that could have happened happened during that story. Um, and it, it led to a lot of sleepless nights on all our staff's part, not only because, you know, Lee was getting death threats and she was she had enraged the Bitcoin community in a way that I was unfamiliar with. Um, and we hadn't realized that we would need crisis comms so much that, you know, we called Edelman's emergency line. But um, I think I had never seen that scale, but we did decide that, that at that point, I was, an, I was a director, so I was an executive for the team. Um, we did decide that we were culpable for uh, dealing with uh, the distinct threats. So we were responsible for any distinct threats that had to do with her person. Um, and that meant security in her home. Um, and we were responsible for distinct threats to her digital existence. Um, and one of those things was bank accounts and things like that, making sure that she had credit report stuff put turned on, all of the e-security things you've never heard of. We did all of them. Um, and then we had a universal uh, policy that everyone had to follow through on, you know, securing their information. Um, because I had never, uh, before that I had worked on community management with Al Jazeera. And we had the Israel-Palestine debate waging war on our Facebook page, um, which is a nightmare to manage as a community person. Um, and we also had a lot of Assad supporters who were messaging us fake videos that we then had to evaluate that were super gruesome. Um, in those two cases, uh, both Newsweek and Al Jazeera, um, there wasn't a policy in place to deal with the impact that's on your employees. Because no one knows what exactly you're supposed to do. You are a reporter. All you did was your job uh, to the best of your ability at the time, given your understanding of the circumstances. Uh, the 
the fact that the, the, fourth, the folks who consume the fourth estate chose to then attack you, uh, we don't know exactly what we're supposed to do on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think every community management company actually, or a uh, company that has a community really struggles with this policy. You know, it's great to hear that Box is taking all this action, but there's no legal reason that they would have to. Uh, they're choosing to do it as internet good citizens. They're choosing to do it because they see a need and they see that their employees are exhausted by the constant harassment. Um, they see a need for any number of other reasons to solve this problem. And we've all been here all day, intermittently at least, um, trying to figure out what, what our responsibilities are. But we have no legal reason. Like we, we, there's no obligation on the part of your employer to deal with the fact that due to your work, uh, you are being constantly harassed. Um, and I think that's the struggle. Like we don't have legislative reasons. Um, this isn't covered by OSHA, it's not covered by anything else because we don't, you don't know if this is, this is the new reality, if the past 10 years of online harassment are the way it's going to be, or if a switch is gonna flip in the next 10 years and this is suddenly just gonna have been a blip and we're all going to be remembering uh, what used to happen. Um, so from my experience, you know, I, I think as, as an employer, if my employees are complaining about a particular account or a particular situation that we've put them in, we do our best to use technology to help them. Um, and that we were discussing software earlier. Uh, the reason that we were discussing software is because sometimes you just need to be able to get rid of somebody. <laughs> you know, sometimes the, person address, the, the entity that lives at that IP address is not a good entity. Um, and it needs to disappear from your community for whatever reason. Um, and software can help that, but if you are a smaller entity, uh, if you're a smaller publication, if you're a smaller website, uh, if you are a, uh, a news organization, or if you're, a not, you're an e-commerce site um, and you happen to vend something that isn't popular for some reason, and you know, you've seen this from pizza places to hair salons to that poor dentist in Wisconsin who I disagree with his shooting the lion, but his business was destroyed. Like, you need the software to help you in those circumstances and you may not have access or resources, so I'm hoping that whatever solution we come up with is open source um, so that people can afford to use it, whatever it might be. Um, and with that, I think we've just hit time. Um, do you guys have any closing remarks? Um, oh, you go ahead. I'm good. Oh, okay. I have one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it's important. Just you know, be, we've had uh, this has like been a great conversation. Uh, Kate, you were an excellent moderator. Thank you to all the people who came late on a Saturday uh, night. Um, I hope you all come and have a drink next door. Uh, the wine is free, and I think there are snacks. Um, but but I, but I think uh, online harassment is 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 an internet problem. But it's not just an internet problem. It's a societal problem. The people who undergo the most harassment online are the people who already undergo the most oppression and harassment in real life. Um, and the harassment that women, that people of color, that LGBT community experiences online is similar to the hatred and the oppression that they experience on the sidewalks. Um, so unless we address that bigger issue, um, especially with education and young people who are growing up in, in, in this world, um, with a guy like Trump who might become president, um, we need to, to address those issues head on if you want the issue online. Uh, well, two other thoughts, I mean, and again, to echo the moderating here, everyone for participating and coming. Um, I think I think you know we, we we are prone to putting this kinds of issues uh, you know because they're so prominent and so important as just for individuals, but uh, you know companies need to take this stuff seriously even beyond the policy side of it. You know I, I'm thinking right now of Yelp, which has gotten in so much trouble on their own brand because they don't moderate people having negative content and devalues the whole product. Um, that's a community problem. That's a problem where they don't have a policy in place to make what they're doing be reflective of the values that they want it to. Be, to be exhibiting, namely that reviews mean something. Um, it's a very different problem than you know a reporter getting harassed. Not you know it's a very very more, much more personal one. But like that's a thing that has to be built into the DNA of the organization. As we see, you know a, a Trump type per personality getting so much attention. I'm actually gratified that that is happening. Surprisingly, not because I agree with pretty much anything that he's saying, but uh, I think those kinds of of uh, expressions and thoughts have always been there, right. and it's getting a lot more attention than it ever has had before in a context where uh, eventually, hopefully, 
he'll get called out for it, and the other people who have gotten away with it in much less, uh, much less obvious ways um, are going to have to have a response to it. And if that pushes the politics in the longer term than just the next three months towards a more positive environment, uh, so much the better for all of us. Rob, cool. anything else? Um, no? <laughs> yeah, no, you, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, at least my experience at, at Genius has been positive so far. I hope that it can be a model for, for the rest of the internet, but also understand that um, that may be a bit idealistic, or a lot idealistic, um, the world doesn't operate in that way. But if there's anything to, to take out of the Genius, is, is that you know, if we're fostering our communities to operate towards one specific kind of goal and a common goal, um, you know, you can have positive, maybe more positive interactions where, you know, someplace like Twitter or Facebook and it's just the Wild West out there. Um, again, co completely idealistic, I'm, I'm you know. Yeah, you know, you guys I, I, have had a really good experience. So yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm glad somebody did. My friend over here now just scared the hell out of me, so then we're going to attack and we're going to draw up a plan. But no, um, you know, we're going to continue to work and as the company grows and the community grows to, to help our model become more scalable and, and hopefully curb. Well, don't don't We've been lucky so far. Yeah, don't forget your employees. The thing that we tend to do is under resource the community team and yeah. then shit happen. Yeah. And, and hopefully the software solutions we were talking about vproud yeah. earlier and, and tools like that which uh, hopefully will be models for for further ways of having uh, more on the on the, the tool side and pressuring the twitters and facebooks of the world to, to take this seriously you, you know, one more thing too because yeah. you said don't forget the employees and even if it isn't my specific job to manage the community we're actually taught over at genius that it's all of our jobs we, we take an hour every week where we all sit the whole entire company and go and annotate and use the site as community members and we all do it outside of that hour but it's one hour that we all take together and, and it really helps the community, the people outside of the company feel like a stronger connection with, with the people who are actually working in the company. So That's the most proactive I've heard for a while. All Fingers right. crossed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.